So, I am a couple of years shy of 40 this year. And in my life and my ministry, I have seen a number of changes and controversies within the church. Uh, the one that's coming to mind right now is the feminist movement that was really taking hold about 15 to 20 years ago. I remember being in church and hearing that the NIV Bible had gone full liberal and there was going to be gender-inclusive language in it. A few years later, what was called Today's New International Version came out. And it just brutalized scripture by uh, translating the word for brothers as brothers and sisters. As if Paul might have had anything to say to women. Uh, it, it also rendered men as people, or uh, mankind as people kind. I'm uh, sorry, that should be humanity. Uh, sons was translated as children, and that was obviously a huge problem that true Christians needed to rise up and stand against. Now, uh, like the very word of God was at stake, people were saying. But I think, honestly, that those are good, dynamic translations of the intent of the writers of Scripture. Now, on the other hand, a denomination which shall not be named kept running with it. And they argued that Christianity had both oppressed and contributed to the oppression of women through the patriarchal male bias of the Bible, and they wanted to change that. So they proposed removing all of the God the Father statements from the Bible and replacing that with God the Mother. There was a hurdle produced of feminist worship songs, and uh, they even proposed scrubbing scripture of anything that could be taken to reflect archaic cultural values that, in their opinion, should just be thrown in the dumpster. Some people even suggested that the church start saying, all women, because all men is obviously misogynistic. <laughs> people, people really got mad at each other, though. That, like, what was going on in the church? From the translation and application of scripture to the way we talked about God, it reflected a very real shift in what was going on in culture. People were becoming aware of history in a way that they never had before. And, and the women who were raised by the women who stepped out of the home in the Second World War to work in the factories, they had joined the women's liberation movement in the 60s and the 70s. These women were now seeing their own daughters grow up in a society that still did not give them equal value as people. There was lip service, of course, but the pay gap was still real, the glass ceiling was still a real thing. Leadership positions in large companies were still boys clubs. <coughs> it's a problem that we're still facing. It's wrong. Studies show that a woman's confidence peaks at age nine. From that time on, culture is relentlessly pursuing a narrative that uh, they are weak, that they are unlovely, that they are unstable. On the other hand, men as a group have their individual and societal role constantly. It's affirmed. And so male confidence continues to grow to the point where male confidence actually peaks during middle age. Other studies show that when there's a mixed group of, of genders having a conversation, men think that the conversation has been equal when women have spoken around 25% or less of the time. Any more than that, and the people in the study, the men in the studies, perceived that the women had dominated the conversation. Men are far more likely to speak over or interrupt a woman than another man. I hear stories about how careful female leaders need to be with the way they dress, and how they speak and carry themselves so that male leaders don't feel threatened and the way that they need to phrase things borderline obsequiously just to have their ideas heard and accepted. What about inside the church? Even if women might be just as capable as men might, is there a divine mandate that says when it comes to following God, men have a corner on the market, and women, they just kind of need to take a back seat and learn to be women. For a good chunk of church history, people have apparently thought so, and they could point to chapter and verse in scripture to make the case. But were they right? This spring, 
at Island Wesleyan, we've been working through a series of messages called Head and Heart. We're looking at real answers to honest questions about Christianity. These questions are questions that real people have asked me, and they're, they're real people are probably likely to go on asking them. In today's secular culture, making a leap of faith to belief in Jesus Christ, becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, has become harder and harder. How would we answer these questions? Could either make that leap of faith smaller or turn people away from faith altogether? Our key verse. Does anybody remember just the reference for the key verse? I'm wondering. The, the book for the key verse? Okay, we're, we're in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 50. And by the end of the series, we're going to see if we can do this from memory. But for now, it's up on the screen behind me. I'm not going to ask you to be wrong. But it says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Sometimes the answers to these questions aren't going to be the ones that people are wanting to hear. But how we present the answers, how we present them, goes a long way to whether their hearts are able to receive and accept them or not. And sometimes their questions are based on misconceptions that we can clear up and we can help guide them what the Bible actually says. Those are my favorite questions. Sometimes... We just have to own that we, as people, have gotten it wrong. When people on the outside look in at Christianity, rather than this beautiful faith connecting people with a real and a loving God, they often see a misogynistic religion that has been used as a tool for men to oppress women for thousands of years. They point to how society in general treats women, and they lay the blame for that on the doorstep of the church. When they consider whether Christianity offers truth, they ask questions like, does the Bible really say that God is male? And doesn't Christianity just oppress women? Those are honest questions that matter to people. And we need to figure out whether this is one of those times that we need to gently advocate for biblical truth, or we need to own that the church has historically been wrong in what it's teaching. And we have to tell them what the Bible actually says. But during this series, I've spent a lot of time explaining the issues behind the questions before I offer the answers. But I'm going to change that up a bit today. I'm going to tell you the answers straight out, and then I'm going to explain. Because the answers are really pretty simple. Does the Bible really say that God is male? No. Does Christianity oppress women? No. Yes. Sort of... <clears throat> Historically, sometime, okay, so maybe this one's not quite as simple. So I'm going to start with the easy one. Does the Bible say that God is male? No, it does not. Anyone who says otherwise is misrepresenting the teaching of Scripture. God is spirit. The Bible clearly implies that in John chapter 4, verse 24, when Jesus says, God is spirit. And in Luke 24, 39, Jesus points out that a spirit has no flesh and bones. We often picture God as this, this big dude in a toga with a thick white beard, sitting on a massive throne in heaven with lightning in his fist. But as I said last week, that is Zeus, not the God of the Bible. God does not have a beard, and he's not wearing a toga, and whatever may be going on beneath that theoretical toga is not a defining attribute of masculinity. With the confusion that's going on in our society right now around gender and how we define it, I don't know how much that helps, but I can say definitely, definitively, from Scripture, God is not physically male. When the Bible talks about creation and the ordering of humanity in Genesis 1.27, it says, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Both male and female have been made in God's image. Women bear just as much of the divine image as men do. In 1 Samuel 15, verse 29, as, as this is as translated in the NASB Bible, God himself says, The glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man. Now right there should settle it, right? Except that God is not remotely trying to make a statement about gender in that passage. Throughout the series, we've taken time to look at 
how scripture was written and transmitted and translated and interpreted. Because the Hebrew word for this really does mean man. When the NIV translates it as, the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being, I think that's really what God is teaching. A literal, straight reading of this passage might actually imply that having dangly bits is what makes a person prone to lying or changing their mind. And while some might argue that that's true, it's not what God is saying here. Now we do have to own that Jesus Christ could pee standing up. He was anatomically male. And while God is spirit, he gets referred to as he, and Jesus calls him Father. And that's what is written in Scripture. We've said from the beginning of this series that the Wesleyan Church believes that all Scripture is inspired, is inerrant, and infallible. So we look at Scripture, though, as we look through it, and last week we, we came down hard on this. We need to sort through what is being taught and what is simply background stuff. The background stuff is there to help people understand what is being taught. Cultural background is used for communication. And just because that background understanding is used to teach something, it doesn't necessarily mean the background understanding is right. That's not always a comfortable distinction to have to make. We, we, we crave black and white simplicity and certainty so often, but it's a reality that we have to live in if we truly want to honor the Word of God in our lives. So, God is spirit, but I love the way that the Wesleyan Articles of Religion put this. By intention, he relates to people as father. By intention. Not by intrinsic identity, not because he is gendered to take on the role of father, but by intention. He does it for a reason. And yes, I am very aware that I keep saying he. That is somewhat by intention as well, because I have to call him something. In her book, The Fire in the Equations, Science, Religion, and the Search for God, Kitty Ferguson said, the author of a book on the topic of science and religion needs a pronoun for God. Regardless of whether I choose to call God he or she, I find myself making a statement that I don't want to make. Using them interchangeably seems contrived and gets confusing. She slash he or he slash she is cumbersome. And one still has the problem of which gender comes first in the pairing. It will not do. Lacking a better solution, I've chosen to use he, which makes the weaker statement and is more easily interpreted as inclusive. What she is rightly saying is that God is bigger than gender. But the English language lacks the ability to conveniently express that. The problem with language is that it's developed to explain what we encounter in our day-to-day -day natural lives and not to deal with things that by definition transcend natural understanding. So what I'm saying here is that there's an element of convenience to how God presents himself in Scripture. There's also an element of convenience to how God has presented himself in history. When Jesus entered the world in the womb of the Virgin, when B.C. became A.D., he entered a geographical and a cultural context. If he had chosen to take on the flesh of a woman, which he could have, his life and ministry would have been very different. I mean, you think Joan of Arc had it rough? Imagine being a woman in first century Judea claiming to be the Messiah. Women weren't even allowed to sit with the men in a synagogue, let alone read scripture or teach. A female rabbi? Come on. In that time, in that place, in that culture, a woman's testimony was not even considered valid in a court of law. Now, Jesus could have come down and pushed through all that. He could have made a huge stink to fix that, but that was not his mission. And his mission would have absolutely gotten lost in the mix. So I would go so far as to say that Jesus relates to people as son by intention as well. <clears throat> when God relates to people as father in a scriptural context, he communicates things within a cultural context that are based on their understanding of what father means. Those things would not have been communicated if he identified himself as their mother in heaven. And that's not to say, though, that the idea of mother doesn't communicate true things about God. In fact, there are several points in scripture where God uses, he, he presents by intention with female imagery. 
particularly when he wants to communicate the nurturing, comforting, birthing role that is just as much a part of him as any others. A lot of the time, the historical church has, has ignored or they've downplayed that. You see, this is where we get into that second question, does Christianity oppress women, and my kind of hedging around that answer. As I'll explain in a bit, raw Christianity does not oppress women. However, the Christian church has historically oppressed women. There is no useful way to answer this question that does not involve acknowledging that truth. The risk of beating the drum a bit here, that has not been the history of the Wesleyan Church. Women would speak and lead and even vote in the Wesleyan Methodist connection long before suffrage. The Wesleyan Church is firmly egalitarian, by which I mean we believe that God equips and calls women to do everything that he equips and calls men to do. The last general superintendent of the Wesleyan Church before Wayne Schmidt was Dr. Joanne Lyon, and I am proud of we don't believe that there are divinely mandated gender roles that say men do this and women do this. Except for having babies. God did not build men to do that. And that is fine with us because we would rather do easier and more pleasant things like lead churches or climb mountains. All through history, though, the church has told women to sit down and shut up. Men have been placed in positions of power. And on the whole, we have enjoyed that advantage. Sometimes men have abused that advantage. There are some arguments to be made from Scripture, but for the most part, the men that are in charge, the men in power, are the ones that are deciding how these verses get applied. Sometimes there have actually been active attempts in church history to adjust Scripture, to shore up that male-dominant position. The church has been a boys' club, and for the most part, there's not been any particular interest on the part of the boys in changing that. A few weeks ago, we asked if the Bibles that we have say what they are supposed to say. And we looked at how scholars sort through all these variant readings of, of copies of copies of biblical manuscripts to find out what the originals actually would have said. When I talked about the worry that people have around that issue, I referenced a book called Misquoting Jesus by Dr. Bart Ehrman. I said it was presenting kind of this uh, pop, uh, you know, mess... Uh, alarmist viewpoint that was really great for selling books, but was a bit disingenuous. And I was also careful to say that he is a top scholar in the field of New Testament textual criticism. One thing he got very right in that book is that we can see places in, in those New Testament manuscripts where the Bible actually teaches about women in leadership, they've been altered, and how the Christian church has misunderstood and misrepresented Christianity when it comes to the role of women. Because right from the beginning, women have always been leaders in Christianity. And from pretty close to the beginning, some men did not want to accept that. I'll give you an example if I can get this uh, remote working again. Robert, if you wouldn't mind just uh, picking up the, the sermon and, and carrying it on. So, here, here's example number one. In Romans chapter 16, Paul sends greetings to a woman named Junia and a man who is presumably her husband, both of whom he calls foremost among the apostles. That's in Romans 16 verse 7. This is a significant verse because it is the only place in the New Testament where a woman is referred to as an apostle. And this is such a big deal that a number of interpreters have insisted that it cannot mean what it seems to mean and so they copied and translated that verse as referring not to a woman named Junia, but to a man named Junius. The problem with this is while Junia was a common name for a woman at that time, there is no evidence anywhere in the ancient world for a man being named Junius. Paul is absolutely referring to a woman named Junia, even though some modern English Bibles continue to refer to this female apostle as if she was a man named Junius. And sometimes scribes have actually made other tweaks around this passage. There are a few manuscripts that instead of saying, greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives and fellow prisoners who are foremost among the apostles, the line was changed to greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives, 
and also greet my fellow prisoners who are foremost among the apostles. Because something was obviously wrong with what Paul seemed to be saying. Now again, in Acts and Romans, Paul's companions, Priscilla, also known as Prissa, uh, and Aquila, are mentioned. They led a house church. And the interesting thing about, as they're acknowledged together, Priscilla's name comes first. And, and pr placing Priscilla's name first indicates she was the more prominent of the couple. It didn't happen often in that culture that a woman's name would be placed first in writing. So it definitely meant something when it was. It's telling that there are a number of manuscripts that reverse the order that the names are in to put Aquila's name first. See, this is why textual criticism is so important. This is why I, I like it, I enjoy it, I get passionate about it. Because we want to get to what the Bible actually says and avoid muddying stuff up with issues like this. For the most part, as I said a few weeks ago, this kind of stuff is pretty easy to sort out with the manuscript evidence that we have. There is no doubt in my mind that Scripture says Junia was an apostle and she was female. And there is no doubt that Paul lists Priscilla's name first. We can sort bias from truth. But we do have to acknowledge that there are a couple of passages in the New Testament that seem to be straight up prohibitions against women being in leading roles in the church. Now, as Wesleyan, I have had to deal with them because they're used to attack us and, and, and say what's, why we're wrong with being egalitarian. And if you're discussing this issue with somebody, with gentleness and respect, you will need to know why these passages are not actually prohibiting female leaders. And the most famous one is found in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, which says, I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. And yeah, that seems pretty clear. And it stays clear as long as you pull it away from the verses around it and don't look at all at the original language. It's the sort of thing that people do if they don't really care what God is actually trying to say in Scripture and they just want to use it to enforce their own positions. But if you are like me, be like Pastor Aaron, if you are like me and you want to live by the teachings of Scripture rather than trying to teach Scripture what you want it to say, you dig into the context. And I could spend a long time on this. I have had to in the past. If anyone wants to dig into this with me, either one-on-one -on -one or in a later message, I would love to. But we don't have that time right now. So here are the bare essentials between the context of the letter as a whole and the immediate lines around it in chapter 12. It is clear to me that Paul is talking about priestesses of Artemis who converted to Christianity but were still claiming both priestly authority and we're mixing in teachings and practices of the cult of Artemis. When Paul prohibits them from teaching or having authority over a man, and even the language there is iffy in the Greek, it was situational, not an everywhere forever thing. So, I explain that to people, but then they say, what about 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 33 to 35 then, smart guy basically says the same thing, but clearer. It says, As in all the churches of the saints, let the women keep silent, for it is not permitted for them to speak, but to be in subjugation, just as the law says. But if they wish to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. That is blunt, that is brutal, and that is universal. So that should really be the end of it, right? Jared uh, asked me about this passage right at the beginning of this series. It's unfortunate he's not here today, but uh, he can watch it online. I told him that it would come up later. I'd give him a better answer then, and that then is now. There are two big textual issues with this passage. The first is internal. Those that were here for Head and Heart 2 will remember internal evidence is the stuff that's in the same writing, in this case, a letter, that works for or against the text that we're questioning. Just three chapters previously, Paul says that when women pray or prophesy in church, they're supposed to wear head coverings. You know, when they speak in church. So first he gives 
the instructions for how they're going to speak in church, how they're supposed to speak in church. And later on, he says they should never, ever, anywhere speak in church. Because of the law? That doesn't sound like the Paul who commends Priscilla for running a church and, and worshiped at Lydia's church in Philippi and calls Junia an apostle? What gives? Well, looking at the external evidence, the stuff that's outside of the immediate text, like looking at other manuscripts, verses 33 to 35 are what is called a floating text. And that means, yes, this passage, this, this set of lines, appears in every manuscript that we have existing now of 1 Corinthians. But it's not always in the same place. Sometimes it's after verse 40, for example. When that happens, it's usually because a scribe wrote a note in the margin and a later scribe inserted it into the text of his copy for reasons. So what most likely happened is that a very early scribe who was familiar with the First Timothy passage, probably a recent convert from Judaism, who was familiar with synagogue practices and the law, made a margin note for their own study. It was likely on a first or second generation copy. And when people came to copy it, they stuck it in where they thought it was supposed to be, and then it was copied on from there. And the theory makes even more sense when you find that if you remove those verses, starting with, as in all the churches, and ending with, speak in church, and you stick the first half of verse 33 up to 36, the passage, the chapter actually flows better, and it makes a bunch more sense. So when it comes to the proof texts that get used to keep women from leadership roles in the church, one of them is being misunderstood and misapplied, and the other one isn't actually in the Bible. So yeah, for all the times in church history when Christianity was used to oppress women, oops, women are the spiritual anchors of most Christian homes and churches. Timothy's grandmother was the one that Paul pointed to as the role model for Timothy's faith. The history of Christianity has been blessed by women who would not sit down and shut up. But they confidently, they, 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 they used, they asserted, they, they took to heart the gifts and graces that the Holy Spirit had given, and the innate talents and abilities and desires that God had built into them. So women in church history have been brave where men cowered. Female missionaries have done far more to spread the gospel in the world than men have. They went where men were afraid, too afraid or too important to go. Churches throughout Western Canada were planted by women because men were too busy or something. While most of the apostles were in hiding, women were at the foot of the cross. Well, the men were crouching behind locked doors. The women were at the tomb. In fact, in fact, I love this. If we define Christians as people who, as Romans 10 verse 9 says, people who confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead, if we define Christians by those two things, there was a period of time when the only Christians on the entire planet were women. first Christian teaching about the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the testimony, the spoken words of women. Does Christianity oppress women? Definitely not. In fact, it liberates them. And I don't mean some sort of sideways liberation that liberates them to be exactly womanly and frees them to be okay with being less than men. Compared to most other religions of that time, even compared to the Jewish roots of Christianity, Christianity elevates women. It gives them important places in the Jesus story. It acknowledges them as gospel bearers and leaders in the early Christian community. When it gives instructions about women, it is invariably more liberal than surrounding culture. There's a trajectory there that's worth noting. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul tells them that there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's Galatians 3.28. When women have been oppressed in the name of Christ, Christianity has suffered. 
One of Satan's greatest victories was muting the voices of half of God's faithful people. We need to be grateful for the women in our lives and in our churches. We need to listen to the women in our lives and churches. The church in particular needs to empower women for leadership. We need to be proactive in it. The church should be the leading voice in elevating women, not the loudest dissenting one. So, for the women that are gathered here, I say thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the way that you have anchored your homes and your churches. Thank you for the times that you have given voice to what God has shown you in Scripture and in life. Your voice is important. Stand up and speak it.